My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm here with my dearest friend, Lydia Rangelowska, who is still my dearest friend despite the fact that we had married. And I'm here with another very dear friend, and we are still dear friends despite the fact that we hadn't seen each other at the very least for 30 years. 30 years. At, at the very least for 30 years. So here we are, you know, she's in her 50s, don't tell anyone. I'm in my 60s. <laughs> I'm in my 70s. And Benny is in his 70s. I'm a proud 70s year old. Yes, a young 70s year old. So we are a cross cut of the most, the generations that had experienced the most transition, the most changes, and the most transformation than many, many uh, previous generations. And so today, what I, I would like to discuss is the process of mourning or the process of grieving. I think Lydia mourns the country that used to be known as Yugoslavia, a country that had disintegrated in a bloody civil war, the likes of which, frankly, we haven't seen since the Second World War, including the war in Ukraine. Mm. So I would like to discuss with her her process of mourning and grieving and what she possibly had learned from the disintegration of Yugoslavia with regards to Europe, future of Europe, and more general uh, human values and human behaviors. Similarly, I have a feeling, although I may be misled, but I have a feeling that in some ways, Benny is grieving and mourning the Israel that used to be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I would like to discuss with him his process of mourning and grieving. What is, it that he, what is it that he misses most? And what lessons possibly he can derive from the way things used to be and uh, the way things are going? I'll start with Lydia, uh, first of all, because she's to my left and I'm a leftist. And second reason, she's a woman and ladies are always first. And I would start with her and I would ask her, could you tell me what is it that you mourn and grieve most about Yugoslavia? The values. Mm -hmm. the, the that was values. a short one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I usually put everything in a word or in track. So the values of that time, when I was growing up, my formative years, um, my, in, in the 70s, my formative years, 10 years, up to teenage time. So I entered the, the cultural shock introduced by many new technologies in the 80s that shaped me as a teenager who was rebellious and introduced uh, many new things and determine the future, as we are seeing and we are living, given today. Value, Nothing really... Values is a big word. Can you, the bring, values, can you give me the a values, few examples? The values. Give the, in, the, the in, the first, in the first formative years, up to teenage years, the values are the family, mm -hmm. the social environment, where you actually start to feel and uh, to have, the, to taste the, the grounds, the very fundamental needs of being feeling free, expressing yourself, you know, at the same time feeling uh, secure, safe in the environment. You know that you are with people, you're not alone, so there were not fears, I will be left alone. As for example today, and what we saw in the pandemic was like many people freaked out, we know about it. They, they had even, they created uh, depression, some committed suicide, they had uh, PTSD, CPTSD until today, their values were changed because they didn't know, you know, uh, they, they had fears uh, of being alone. They found themselves being alone. They didn't know what to do. So values, mm -hmm. when I say values is what are you worth? Sure. We were encouraged, mm -hmm. we were encouraged by the system, by our social uh, environment, uh, people around us. Uh, they, they, in, uh, they were the ones who validated the gifts and talents everyone possessed. We had teachers, you know, who were uh, 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 actually uh, telling and were in contact with our parents where, uh, we, in what we are good. I remember when I finished primary school, they said, okay, now there will be another another trendy thing, like uh, there is a school opening for IT. I said, what on earth is IT? I didn't know what is IT. I mean, 
What so, is IT? Yeah, information but it was hmm? information, information technology. technology. Oh, okay, so okay. it was, I was the second, no, my sister, it, uh, she was two years older than me. She was the first generation uh, to study IT. So, okay, here come the computers. That is challenge. Let's see who knows what. And uh, uh, the values were important. Uh, for the gifts and to develop and uh, the, the, every, the talents. Every generation has values. This, gener this generation mm. also has values. Uh, you may dis yeah, you may they have values to make money only. Okay, you may disagree. To so use the technology. Just a second, I didn't come to it. Okay. So, when I was uh, in, uh, growing up, developing, let's say, as a teenager in those years, you know, I, there were things uh, uh, newly uh, introduced. And we were directed, like, also there was Yugoslavia at the time. They were making, like, five-year, ten-year plan. Uh -huh. They were publishing the need of professions and uh, 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 asking for, um, uh, for the quota in the certain universities. We, need, we, have more, uh, we have built more factories, so we need more engineers, mechanical engineers, construction. So we had some direction and it was not only by the parents uh, and uh, the, the, the education was free. We were not buying uh, our, uh, I mean, we were not paying uh, tuitions or anything. So every, it was a choice, but we were competing for knowledge. Who will, it was positive uh, competition, not competition out of envy or that created envy, okay, and we were not jealous but uh, uh, to each other, but trying to gather the, you know, with other, to be in company with other who, who would have contributed to something, to create something together, something, uh, to introduce something new. I would like to focus on, on two, two of the values, or, or the interactions actually, and then we move on to, to the civil war in Yugoslavia and what do you think it meant uh, for European history and, and so we'll come to that in a minute. But let's first focus on, on two of the things you've mentioned, as you mentioned many things, two of the things you've mentioned, the relationship between older generations and younger generations, older generations, for example, your teachers, your parents, so older generation, younger generation, and the family as an organizing principle, and within the family, the relationships between men and women. So let's start yeah. with let's start with older and younger generation. You implied that older generations nurtured and and uh, directed. helped directed and helped younger generations to self actualize to realize their potential. Yeah, they were mostly educators. Mm -hmm. So when my parents were at work, I finished school or I was from uh, in the kindergarten. So after that, at school, I came back. There was no one there inside, okay, at home. It was the neighbor who took care of me, you know. So and as, uh, a, as a young person, you could trust adults. You trusted adults. We had mm -hmm. respect towards them. because respect they were or trust? Did you trust them? Look, you can't respect uh, someone if you don't trust. At least at my vocabulary. Okay. Uh, uh, you have to respect a personality. What if you don't? It is, I, I, I can't see. <laughs> the possibility uh, not to be able to trust someone. And it was known, we all trusted each other. We were there, it was like a unit. It was did you trust your peers as much as you trusted adults? Or did you trust adults more? Uh, than uh, you? It's not more or less. Okay. It's about who contributed what. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, how you were encouraged and supported, you know. Uh, some of them were not loving, some of them were just fighting, you know, provoking. But yes, there were some narcissists in my life before. There were bullies in, at school, you know. But uh, uh, we were moderated by the elders. The teachers had different approach, explaining, you know, and they were punishing what happened. We, they, they encouraged us to communicate and solve the problem. So, solving a problem, it uh, also can come only by intelligent people. And did you try... So, did it's you about, mm -hmm. uh, you, you actually respect 
the one's ability, uh, capability, worth, standards, principles, based on their own experiences, and you learn to trust them. Did you try also, did you want also to emulate them or imitate them? Were they role models? Uh, they were just validating. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's inevitable that uh, unconsciously you are molded by these people. You are exposed to them. You are with them 24 hours, right? But were you consciously and saying, when I grow up, I want to be like this woman? No. Or, I personally, mm -hmm. I, I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it was known. Uh, people were, or well, elders were saying, and uh, by tradition, you know, children were uh, taking uh, the examples from their parents. If the parent is a doctor and talks about medicine only, of course the child is more familiar to that and he will go and continue in a medical school. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it, is, it was the preference, not the preference, it was also, uh, so we have, I know many friends that they inherited the profession of their, of their uh, parents just because, you know, yeah, they were exposure. more exposure. exposed to such uh, environment. Now, some people say, <coughs> including in this, in this sphere, in the Balkans. The Balkans, first to clarify to the viewers, the Balkans is a bit of a throwback. It's an enclave of traditionalism and so on, compared, for example, to Western Europe or to Northern Europe. Definitely to Canada, United States, North, and North America. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still somewhere, you know, 30 years back or 40 years back, even, even with what's happening. So, but even here in the Balkans, some people say uh, it's better to be alone, better not to have a family than to have an abusive family. And families of the past, people felt less able to divorce, mm -hmm. less able to resist abuse, less able to talk about it openly less able to break up, now it's much better. There was. Now it's much better, even if many, many people choose to remain single, they are much happier than people in the past who were in families. The, the, there was a uh, social shame in my time. And they, and they uh, didn't want to mention divorce. My parents were fighting, they did not, I mean, there was some bad dynamic between them, from, but from time to time. I'm not going to discuss my personal uh, or their, to analyze their dynamic, dynamics. However, both of them are dead. I'm old for now. And uh, I learned from the, the influences from them. I know what my mother's profession was. I know my father's profession was. And you saw me doing both of them. And you appreciate it when I know how to fix things or when I'm taking care about the home <laughs> budget or planning or whatever. And I once had and learned the, the profession from my mother, but I was exposed to it. We were talking about it all the time. So it's the influence that comes on unconscious level. Uh, we, after that, we break. Uh, about the family uh, units, uh, I, I, it was more important for people then, in my environment, uh, the values, right? To be, uh, to work and to honestly, uh, to be honest, not a thief or not to steal or whatever. They were proud uh, to take a salary and to buy something. And it, it was their achievement. You know, the, the values of appreciating the knowledge I gained, uh, made independently, without any crimin crime uh, or whatever, uh, uh, to earn the money honest, and to be able, reason. so honest they were proud. But in, in I'm, I'm social still, I still would like you to focus on, on my question, which is, isn't it better to be single as uh, many uh, as uh, many You are? can't insist on this. Because, <laughs> no, no, because there is, there is, there was a change. Uh -huh. There was a change with the transition, this shame, social shame. Okay. Uh, the traditions, the, the traditions, uh, what marriages, how one should behave. Mm -hmm. uh, you should give, help the other, be there, you know. We were, uh, it, then suddenly there was this uh, war. Uh, we lost our f 
freedom was safety. We, there were many people that uh, uh, started to still to abuse uh, the country that didn't have their own rules. The laws were not introduced. We were still living from Yugoslavia uh, laws. They were not changed for decades after that. Decades, not one decade, decades. And when you uh, talk about the war, you talk about Kosovo? Uh, no, I'm talking about Macedonia. There was a transition period when the values changed. The family, the social values turn to materialistic, individualistic, selfish uh, uh, values. Who will have more money? Now is the time. There are no laws. Let's, uh, let's divide. Let's steal. Let's take. So this is contradictory to how I grew up because I valued people differently. I learned to trust them differently, you know. But uh, times changed. Some of them overnight took over uh, the advantages that they were, you know, and it was a house. And their children today, they don't know how to behave. They are in their 20s, 30s. They are uh, parents and they don't know how even to to connect uh, and to sense the needs of their own children. And it's sad because this transitional period changed the values of being a human. So I see that there is a big, there are many young that they don't feel, they don't know who they are, let alone to get married, let alone to think of a family. Because some, in, some elder in their family is telling them, you should respect yourself, you should have a family. But they say, okay, but I saw what happened. I see my peers, I see uh, the changes. I don't feel ready and, uh, and I can't take responsibility to be even uh, to be a parent. I don't know how. You see, and there is a blame. Young generations, they shift the blame to elders. How come you didn't do this? How come now? I heard this uh, many times, the conversation between uh, parents and, uh, let's say, uh, children in their thirties. I have, uh, I have nieces, nephews. I, I talk to them. I see the, the, I see four generations in front of me. My aunt, her daughter, her granddaughter, a grand granddaughter. Four. And I see the the differences in the values. And uh, my aunt regrets for her time. They, uh, uh, I just came back. I, I met them a few, I mean, on, I came back on the 10th. So, you know, she regrets. She said, I don't understand even my daughter anymore. Let alone to get, uh, to get, how can I teach the other to respect a man? She doesn't know that. She is not even aware who is she. And she is uh, 10 years old. Just now to, to form that's a universal um, thing. Helen Fisher, <coughs> who is a sexologist and psychologist, she conducted uh, the most massive studies among young people, millennials and younger. And she asked them, why don't you get married? Why don't you have relationships? And the main answer was, because we are watching our elders, and our elders are divorcing, none of them is happy in a relationship. Why would, why they would go they have, through why it? Why would we have yeah. one? Yeah, so, exactly. it's, it's universal. Yes. It's not only in, uh, in the Balkans. Now, let, let's move on a bit to a larger, a larger picture. The Balkans uh, has always been the harbinger. The harbinger means um, what you saw here happened 20, 30 years later in Europe. Okay. So, the First World War started essentially in the Balkans, mm. in Serbia and so did, yeah. Everything starts here, it's like a laboratory and then it, it spreads out. Israel is very similar in, in many we ways. We call it Bura Barot, gunpowder. Gunpowder cake, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just need cake. a spark. But not only as far as war, I think many social trends actually that start here and, and uh, for example, your attitude to sexuality, amazingly, yeah, it's was much more liberal here way before it was liberal in Germany. Yeah. Germans used to come to Croatia. And we had the first beaches. Two? Two. Nudist. Nudist beaches. beaches. Uh -huh. 
because sexuality in, in Croatia, not everywhere, but in Don't. Croatia, Slovenia to some extent, Sexuality. I was led to believe that it was Scandinavia that was no, more Scandinavians open. Scandinavians were coming here. here. Yeah. Scandinavians oh, came okay. here. So Swedish, the Swedish came here, returned to Scandinavia. We know that because they have, they made movies. There's a famous movie about Swedish and German couples coming to to Croatia to a nudist beach. Not Croatia, Dalmatia. Dalmatia, which okay. is part of Croatia, to a nudist beach and then exporting this. To, and there's an even more famous movie where there is a worker in a hotel. She's a cleaning, cleaning lady, chambermaid in a hotel. Yes. And she, she comes from a village and she witnesses the sexual promiscuity <laughs> in Dalmatia, which is a part of Croatia. And she witnesses and, and then she returns to her village and brings with her these so, sexual mores. But I'm giving sex as an example. Many, many social trends actually started here. Uh, even in terms of, for example, usage of computers and information technology, strangely, some parts of the Balkans were more advanced mm. than Europe. So it's a harbinger, definitely it's a harbinger. And uh, I wanted to, to ask you, the civil war must have been a trauma for you. Civ when I say civil war, to clarify, we are talking about the period 19. between 1991 and 1995. Then there was a Plus. break, a break of four years in the Kosovo War in 1999. And and the civil war uh, in 2001. And the civil war in 2001 in, in, in Macedonia. Macedonia. In Macedonia. Uh -huh, okay. So this this all in all can be called the Balkan Wars. So the Bal Balkan Wars uh, were a trauma to you individually. I want to say it's not only individually. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother was born in uh, 1912. So she survived both Balkan Wars both world wars. <laughs> she died uh, November 1990. The next year we had a referendum and there was no Yugoslavia. So she was uh, from mixed uh, parents. Mother from Greece, father from uh, Montenegro. Uh, her brothers, she was born in Istanbul. Her brother in Brighton in UK and the others, I don't know where, one sister in... So, they were uh, mixed. We were mixed. What Greeks, Serbians, uh, Bulgarians, whoever, doesn't understand, is that Macedonia was always mixed. It was a crossword. There were many uh, nationalities, many religions. So, they were introducing religion, but there was different respect. People accepted the others. They were living together and they were supporting each other, they found a way how to collaborate. There so were, they... There were many mass conversions, the Serbs converted to Islam. Uh, many Serbs converted to yeah. Islam, many Albanians converted to the Orthodox religion. And not only that, not Catholics, Islam. my friend was yeah. Catholic. Yeah. Albanian friend, Catholic. Her, uh, hmm. her grandfather went to America and he wanted to be Catholic. An oh. interesting thing is that many Orthodox Christians are called Haji. Haji. Haji something. Why? That's because their name. Haji. Haji. It's, it's, it's the surname. Muslim. Somebody it's who goes to Mecca. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, but they went actually to be baptized in the river. You know which one. In it's, the Jordan? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's nice. So. This is uh, what brings us to the Middle East. I'm saying different traditions from different uh, parents, great parents, great grandparents, influences, it's a burden. The, what I like is that all of them were teaching survival because they went through so many wars. Uh, they, some of them didn't know what to eat. They didn't have what to eat. My mother's family moved from another country back and they started from zero. They were planting in their own garden uh, food to survive, to eat. They were making their own uh, drinks. My grandfather there made, built his own house. They were making the tiles. You know, it was uh, investment in a family. Today you don't have that. You have lazy people. Lazy mothers, fathers. They don't know even how to read. They don't know what they need. Just uh, some light life. Why to be concerned now to think about the future and what to do with themselves and if they know something and 
Why would they do that? It's painful. It's narcissistic injury. They will avoid it. So uh, there is how I see through generations that there was stagnation of self-development because they were confused. The generation. Yes. Generational shame. No, I'm I, saying de degeneration. I call it yeah. degeneration, but when in a while in my time, the, the shame was important tool to, to correct yourself, to direct yourself. And there were people who didn't have uh, any benefits, just they really were helpful and useful and uh, cared about the, the other because they also uh, uh, hoped, I mark this word, they hoped that what they were doing to the other they would, the other would have done for them. But the, this uh, was uh, not really believable anymore. And they were in shock. They were in shock. And they didn't know even how, what to say. We lied to you that we had two faces, that we are actually thieves, and we, we stole the property that we all worked for. So it was bad dynamic. It was really, you know, uh, not stabilizing period, and it took uh, too long to stabilize. So we have, yes, complex post-traumatic syndrome that we are recovering even uh, from it until today. And I would say one thing, thanks to the pandemics, something bad happened, but many people stayed at home and they had to talk to themselves and to ask, why are you so bored? What are you going to do? Uh, they, they, all of them became fat after that. Okay, I will run. Don't run if you have weak heart. I mean, don't be in the flow. So they had to uh, find out their own good sides and talents and so on. While we were encouraged by the elders at the time, verified, validated our, our gifts, directed us in a way here now because of the fear of being criticized. That is the narcissistic thing, right? Just because they didn't want to be criticized. They had like a image of themselves that they're successful. No, when the pandemic happened, when they sat at home, they didn't, couldn't do anything. They noticed how dependent they were from other people. I would like to make two comments, uh, put things you said in context, ah. and then I want to ask uh, as we have a Okay, thanks. Uh, two comments. Uh, Lydia, Lydia did a lot of work on shame. And shame is the foundation of personality disorders in the footsteps of Masterson and others. And uh, shame in the formation of codependency and, and opposite of personality disorders. <laughs> dependency on, on personality disordered people. Two sides of the same coin, according to Lydia and many others, myself included. Um, the sociologist Campbell said that we are transitioning from the age of dignity, shame, social reputation, social control via shame. So we are transitioning from age of dignity to the age of victimhood, shameless victimhood. Mm -hmm. Everyone and his dog is a victim of someone. And if they can't find who victimized them, they will invent a victimizer. Mm. They will invent an abuser. Wow. And victimhood victimhood like became, yeah, exactly. First of all, victimhood pays. And victimhood became a defining determinant of identity. And that's why we call it identity politics. The identity today is defined by whose victim you are. As opposed to the past, when identity was defined by how dignified you are how boundary you are, yes. how, how, how strong are your boundaries, how self, how self aware you are, etc. So this is a very sick and pernicious transition yeah. that Lydia had mentioned. Secondly thing Lydia mentioned, which I'm taking off of, <laughs> uh, she mentioned, I'm, I'm putting what you said. Yeah, in yeah okay, good. Thanks. She, she mentioned the, the fact that the Balkans is a melting pot Exactly like the United States. It's a melting pot, and, and today the United Kingdom. It's a melting pot of, in Macedonia alone, well over 20 nationalities and ethnicities. 
And that's a country of two million people. <laughs> so it's a melting pot. You can't really say about any single individual in the Balkans that he belongs to an identifiable national entity. Next. What happened at the beginning of the 20th century, a foreign model, a foreign model of organization known as the nation state, right. mm. a model that started in France with Renan, in Germany with Bismarck, in Italy with Garibaldi, Garibaldi and others, this foreign model, which had nothing to do with the Balkans, was imported by intellectuals into the Balkans and they tried to superimpose this model on populations which were utterly hybrid populations. Yeah. So the first experiment actually was known as Yugoslavia. But Yugoslavia acknowledged the multi-ethnicity. There were components in the federation. It was a confederation. Mm. So they recognized the various peoples. Actually, in the constitution of Yugoslavia, there were six nationalities listed, later seven, when parts of or parts of um, Serbia were declared as uh, special, uh, special autonomous units. So, Yugoslavia was a recognition of the diversity and multicultural and multi-ethnic state sure. of the region. But then after Yugoslavia, when Yugoslavia disintegrated, the constituents of Yugoslavia tried to impose the nation-state model on their populations, which led to this civil war. So, it was a clash of ideologies and a clash of alternative models of organizing polities and politics. And this clash is not finished yet. Definitely not finished. And I therefore predict more conflicts. In, we are seeing a similar conflict take place between Russia and Ukraine. We are seeing, we are seeing two groups of people who once used to be brothers, who once together. shared the same space. Mm. The Russians always called Ukrainians little brother. Russians always considered themselves to have hailed, to have come from the Kiev principality. That was the beginning of Rus, Russia. They were a single space, ethnically, almost, almost linguistically, I mean, the one space. But when a nation-state model was imposed now by Putin on this region, it immediately provoked conflict, mm. exactly like in Yugoslavia. Actually, if you look, there were two extremely bad ideas in human history. One is religion, and one is the nation-state. And Balkans is... But can I ask you, why yeah. do you think that that worked? Imposing, worked? imposing nationality. Broke uh, people. I have my own view, but well, uh, we're interested in no, your no, view. What not, uh, it, I, I'm asking you, what do you think is so powerful? I think exactly like feminism. That is, we discuss sex positivity. I mean, you can sell any idea to to susceptible naive groups. Uh, these intellectuals came. And naive. Yes, these intellectuals came to these groups, most of which were peasants, villagers, in agriculture. They were. They, they didn't have the tools to analyze intellectual statements. They saw professors, they saw, you know, and they, there was a huge respect for intellect and for expertise. And professors here were considered way more venerable than politicians. Yes. Politicians were garbage, trash. It was the professor you looked up to. Yes. Indeed, in all the countries in transition after the Yugoslavia collapsed, and actually after communism collapsed, all over, Professors became prime ministers and presidents. And Czech, the Czech Republic is a wonderful example. You name it, and yeah, professors I became I intellectuals. We're leading this. So, if a professor comes to you and says, you know what? You think you are uh, mixed, but you're not mixed. You're actually Serbian. You're actually Croat. You're actually uh, Albanian. No, the, the Serbians and the Croats are the same, yeah. only they write their script yeah. differently. And so, you, are, you and the Croat it's is your enemy. In other words, I, I consider this to have been a process of brainwashing, counterfactual in many cases. Why it works in people? Because of the respect for authority. I, I believe that I blame the intellectual cadre, I, 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 the intellectuals. I, I, that is how, the, how they are uh, enforcing and imposing. And they are supported by, by 
uh, other powers. That is that we are touching upon some f politics. What does the individual need to know uh, who your uh, ancestors are? You have two. You have two options. You can define yourself by opposition to someone. We call it negative identity formation. So you can define yourself by who you are not. Or you can define yourself by who you are. And what decides whether you define yourself this way or that way are the authority figures and role models in your life. They can tell you it's better to be loving and caring and compassionate and empathic. Or they can tell you it's better to hate the other. It's better to not be the other. It's better to conflict and to fight and to... And so feminism, for example, did exactly this. Feminism started by being inc inclusive. At the beginning, what we call the first wave and second wave, they said men and women should work together. The greatest feminists were men. Men they were the greatest feminists. Men developed the contraceptive pill for women. For women. Exclusively for women. They didn't develop a pill for men. Men supported women. Then third wave feminism said men are the enemy. You should fight with men. You should define yourself against men in contradistinction to men. And all the young women went after them. We, even if we, if we are very defined, we have role models and authority figures. And we emulate them. End of story. I agree that. So I, I witnessed it firsthand. I witnessed it in Serbia. I witnessed it in Kosovo. I witnessed it in Macedonia. How intellectuals are poisoning and creating toxic environments. Why? Why what? Why are they doing that? Because, it, because there's a huge uh, financial and economic we interest. Saw them here. We saw them here. Because of money. They were using bribes money. from the so-called... Uh, of course money. <laughs> okay. So people feel abused, betrayed they by are. this elite and they don't trust anymore. They are. They and, are uh, Yeah. They are. They are and there is no way back. To trust science more than money, I don't see that coming. It's not science, it's intellectuals, they're not scientists. They we know what we are talking about. There is no progress. Uh, Come on, there is no uh, real progress in any. You are the scientist. But you're right. And we know, no one contributes to that. We saw with the pandemic. You're right. Epidemiologists <laughs> didn't know how to explain to, to people the very first two pages that you studied in uh, 30 years, 50 years ago. Okay, so there is uh, a you lot know. of distrust, mm -hmm. and uh, distrust made imposed by by uh, materialism. Betrayal. This is what I we were the betrayal. The intellectual class betrayed the people. I agree with you fully. Did that intellectually until until the betrayal of intellectuals. Until the why would why, then why we are asking now? Why would any other young person today? I would like to, to learn and study and to contribute. Why? They can uh, okay, be hackers, if, if they can blackmail someone. If I and, may join your uh, conversation. No, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm an incorrigible optimist and listening to you, I was thinking about my own country, uh, about Israel, where there were times when family was important, the, the social structure was such that we knew exactly who the enemy was and ergo we decided that we were one entity although we were a melting pot we were a melting pot definitely not less than the united states or the uk or or the the balkans because we really came from all over the world jews from all over the world came to back to their to their old homeland so we knew where, where the enemy lies, we knew who we were, and we, we, we knew who we wanted to become. We had this, these big role models like mm. uh, Ben Gurion and, and Ben Svi and all the others. And all this shifted, and in, in recent years, uh, I'm relating very well to what you said about uh, the narrative of, dig of dignity which made place for victimhood. What we have now is the poisonous narrative of people who claim that they are victims and they are the second, gener they, the second Israel, whereas the elites are the first Israel. And this is 
it's fake. It's a fake story. Fake. And and I feel that that it's leading us astray. But why did I say that I'm in in an incorrigible optimist? Because I think that without without this shift of paradigms, we will not be able to realize what I think is tantamount for, for us, for Israelis, to be able to live together with the Palestinians in, in a way that, for instance, we never mentioned Helvetia or Switzerland, in the way that the, 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 the Italians, the French and, mm -hmm. and the Germans live together in Switzerland and turn their backs, not only a cold shoulder, but turns their back their backs on the Germans, on the French, and on the Italians. It's possible. It's only a question of will. And even good things may happen. And this is how I see it. I agree. And there was, and, and we are saying that, leave us alone. Don't introduce nationality. We are, we were living together. And religious, uh, uh, we accepted the religious uh, religion differences, the capabilities, abilities, where you came from, uh, your ancestors, uh, origin, and whatever. We are here now. We love this place. Exactly. So let us be. The, the, it created anger, and until today, why? Uh, because the Greeks. And Bulgarians still do remind us of that, you know, still about some territory. God damn it, we solved that issue uh, after the war. These vectors will always remain, but, but uh, grassroots, what is grassroots uh, uh, vectors also emerge where people say we don't want, we, enough with, with the indoctrination of politicians and, and of intellectuals, exactly. we want to do whatever we want to yes. do. Uh, there, there are movements now in Israel, Jews and Arabs uh, refuse to be enemies. And this, this tells you, it's all in yes. a nutshell. Jews and Arabs refuse to be enemies. And if you indoctrinate this, it's is like combating uh, third, st third stage uh, feminism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, have three, I have three three questions here. They're not easy. So prepare yourself. But before I ask these three questions, I just want to make a brief statement with your permission, and then I will ask you. Uh, the brief statement is this. Until the end of the 19th century, intellectuals were the friends of the people. You had in Russia the Nagodnitsi. You had intellectuals were the friends of the people. They said, we, we will educate and elevate the people to our level, and we are all in it together. We are also, friends. Also by saying that, the, the, using the word Narodnik, it, yeah. it meant that they, f they saw the benefit of going to the of people. Course. And you saw, for example, intellectuals collecting folk music. Exactly. And, and ethnical and, stuff. Yes. There was affinity between intellectuals. And then, at the end of the 19th century, suddenly the intellectual class, by the way, all over the world, mysteriously, had utterly betrayed the, the people. Utterly betrayed. You saw it, of course, initially with communism in USSR, at the time Soviet Russia. You saw when the, when the intellectuals turned against the people. So you saw the big purges and the gulags and the, you know. But you saw it in other places as well, with the rise of Nazism, which was essentially a highly intellectual movement. We tend to deprecate it, but it was an intellectual. Schmidt. A very intellectual Karl movement. Schmitt. Karl Schmidt, uh, the famous legal scholar, and so on. So intellectuals suddenly betrayed the people. Mussolini was a leading Marxist um, communist theoretician. People don't know that. He was editor of the, of the main organ of the Communist Party. In, in I didn't know that. And then he switched sides, he became fascist. Yes, yes. So there was a betrayal. There was an enormous betrayal of the intellectual class. And from that moment on to this very day, there is a fight between the intellectual class, so-called elites, and the people. People don't trust the elites. And elites hold people in contempt. True. And so on. So this is just a comment. Now to my questions, which are not easy questions. The first one is, are you sure you're not idealizing the Israel of your, the, the Israel of your? Of course I'm idealizing. And here I bring you that uh, maxim that I learned in Latin studies 40 years, uh, 50 years ago. 
the, the, the students of Thales asked Thales, what is the difference between living and dying? So he said, there is no difference. So they asked him, so why don't you die? And he said, because, because there is no difference. So you're asking me whether I, I willingly choose to be an optimist. Yes, I willingly choose to be an optimist. It helps me to survive. It helps me to function. It, it keeps me from uh, sliding into depression. But don't you idealize Ben-Gurion's Israel? Don't, don't you... Is it real, this Israel? Did it ever exist? Okay, okay, good question. Let me ask, let me, let me see. Did it ever exist, or is it, you know? Uh, no, it, I'm, I'm sure it existed. Look, you can't deny that the kibbutz succeeded. Mm -hmm. It succeeded till, uh, for three quarters of a century. Mm -hmm. In the first quarter, the second quarter, and the third. It failed in the fourth quarter of the 20th century, mm -hmm. and it evaporated together with socialism. The, and, and you know what kibbutzim meant in Israel, you, you, you know that. You know that they sent their sons uh, to the wars and yeah. to be, uh, to, to be uh, pilots and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and it's true that, that, uh, that there, were se there were traits there which I'm not proud of. The, the demonization, the total demonization of, of uh, of the Arabs or the Palestinians were, was, was not right. Mm -hmm. I, I am, am to blame to the same degree because I, I believe what I was told, that they all want, want to see us ultimately in the sea. But things change and people mature and you, your, we, uh, you yourself said in an earlier conversation that we do not say, stay the same as we used to be. So. So this leads me to the second question. When you talk to young people, they say, we live in a world that you had created. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I give lectures and so on. Mm -hmm. Most frequent comment mm -hmm. is, we live in the world that you had created. You're responsible for all this mess. If we are promiscuous, it's your doing. Mm -hmm. If, we, if we, we are trying to cope with climate change, you, mm -hmm. you, you did this. You plundered the planet. You were profit motivated. You were corrupt. You were... And we live, we, we, so we, we, we pay for the consequences. Yes. So maybe the Israel of today is the work of your generation. Maybe you should feel very guilty of how Israel turned out to be. Maybe, I'm asking. It's a question. You ask me as a person... Not you as Benny Handel, but maybe the Israel of today, with the Bibi Netanyahu's and worse, <laughs> And other phenomena. I can, I can. Uh, well, Bibi Netanyahu is not is not the first corrupt uh, leader. He, he there yeah. were many before him, and we saw the signs on the wall. And uh, it, it came along. It crept along as time uh, went by. But also social problems, lack of housing, uh, lack of disintegration housing. of the family. Yes, uh, late yes. late yes. onset family. All these was created by someone, no? These people are inhabiting... It was either the creation or the, def or, or the, the default, the not, not, the not, not an enough uh, investment yes. by others. You may be right there, yes. yes, yes. I mean, maybe our generation, our... Yes, our generation. Maybe, maybe our generation should feel a hell of a lot more guilty rather than deflecting the blame and accusing the young. It's no, true, they it's are, true, yes. They are now. But here we are, you know, my generation, uh, you know who Amir Haskel is, the one who started the demonstrations uh, in Balfour. Uh, my generation uh, are, are now carrying the flag, they're raising the flag against against uh, what we call victimhood politics, uh, to be able to bring us, not to bring us back to what was, not to bring us to the socialist state that we had with Ben-Gurion and so forth, but to create something new. I, I could even think of a new uh, Knaanism, which means that maybe the inhabitants of this little land, you know, between the Jordan and the sea should be populated by a nation, like I was, uh, like I was hinting, hinting to Switzerland, uh, by a nation which, is, which has Canaanite roots, like a, a, Semitic, one, a Semitic entity. A one-state solution? A one-state solution with, like, your uh, uh, 
uh, melting point, uh, melting pot uh, uh, ideology or, or uh, entity. Actually, well, it's, it, with us, it's, uh, it was pretty different. We, we did not oppose uh, the difference. You did not accept how I see so it. That's what they're saying. They're saying yes. Yugoslavia. And, and we were not Yugoslavia. Actually, uh, it we know that it was uh, uh, instrumentalized. Maybe I'm striving, uh, Lydia, maybe I'm striving to a solution which you already had up. under Tito. Because not under Tito. Even before Tito. Yes. Yeah. We were always like that. That is, that is the problem. That we were actually not left alone. You know, people knew how to live alone. They didn't need the state. Yeah, Stalin yes. interfered, America yes, interfered. Yes. No one. People loved to be here and do what they wanted to do. And they were free. Wonderful. You know, uh, the, thing is, the thing is that I don't see uh, young generations staying here. Uh, they fled our country. Our... They were educated here, the education was good, I have some friends, they are very successful abroad. Genius, so some of them are uh, world-recognized professionals in their own field. I have many friends abroad and it's still, I blame the, the politics. Whoever comes, they will of course say, you know, with the best intentions we are going to do this and that, but I have this magic fotelia, the armchair. It makes miracles. They all turn eventually to how much money they will have, get, and whatever. So uh, we have another set of politicians that went through the transition and they are more likely to uh, just hold and they promote uh, our values. Exactly. Without making distinction between the groups religions, who is who, what is who. And they are giving, my generation is helping the younger generations to uh, direct them as they once they were are, okay, they directed are, by what, them. What you, what you maybe say is that they I are, feel I they are facilitators. And educators. I think what we need is facilitators yes. and f to facilitate grassroots movements of good people of goodwill, good yes. good doers, forgive yes. my expression, who who know what is right, and I yes. think people do know what is right, yes. and and we have to let them do uh, do away with politicians, for, for and do away with politicians, and do away with uh, poisonous uh, intellectuals. Okay, so Sam, the, the Sam, thing, sorry, yes, the the thing is what I want to say: those who had been through the pain, the beauty, and they made a difference, were traumatized, and they lost some 30 years of their life. Now, they, uh, after the pandemic especially, the latest poli political uh, uh, impositions and whatever it was, I call it bully, Poli uh, uh, bully by uh, the politicians, not in Macedonia, all over the world, they all put their noses Without understanding, you came here. You said, you asked me, you oh, but I know what was communism. No, I was not living communism. I was raised in socialism. I know. I and know. these mistakes, do mind, do mind, because we also want our identity. I want to keep my identity. I am from Skopje. I was born here, but the, I want to keep my freedom of choice, as you do, without being bullied by the Greeks, for example. Do you understand what I'm saying? And look, the, 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 my, in my case, ah, my grandmother, great-grandmother was from Greece. I can't go against myself. So people here know that, and I am hopeful that they will not be stuck in, uh, in uh, nationalism. Uh, they will regain the trust in the institutions, and uh, after the pandemic especially, and uh, we'll really uh, learn, and they will go back to, not really science, but they will find much easier ways how to cope with what with the leftovers from the previous, including my generation. Let me ask 
two more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, Sorry. Elvis is telling me that we have ten minutes left, maybe less. Ten? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you, you, you said that Vicky Mood is bad for business, bad for political business, definitely. But aren't the quintessential victims the Palestinians? Didn't they build their entire ethos and narrative on, on being victims? Perpetual victims, eternal victims, which on purpose wouldn't lift themselves out of a state of victimhood? No question. Victim I, ha I have many, I, I have many uh, bad things to say about, about the failure of, of uh, Palestinians to bring themselves to coexistence with Israel. But what I, I was talking about was victimhood within Israel. Yeah, of course. Okay. But, uh, so what you're saying about the Palestinians is, is true. But luckily, I think there are grassroots um, movements, movements in, in the, at least in Israeli-Palestinian population. You, you, you see Mansour Abbas, for instance, a, a good example for that, uh, where you have tectonic movements saying that we have to stop this nonsense of you and uh, uh, you and us and us and you and we have we we are not going to leave this piece of land we all are meant to be here so let's let's put our heads together and find a way to live here so together so you would say that you're transitioning from two victimhood movements in conflict to a pragmatist approach this is what I'm. This is what I'm hoping for, okay. and this is what I'm working for. Mm -hmm. Last question I want to ask you is about where do you see? Forget politics for a minute. Where do you see the social problems in Israel? Where, where do you, what are, do you think are the main social problems in Israel? You mentioned. I think you mentioned the the uh, housing problem. Yes. Um, it's very difficult to uh, to gain. Uh, some sort of uh, uh, solution for for young couples to to find a home. Uh, since in Israel usually you buy homes, and th this is getting less and less affordable, uh, this is a a, a major uh, social pro pro uh, problem. Um, and so they postpone family formation because yes, of this. Yes, You think it's a main reason? Yes, that they yes are, it is. You think that housing being more more affordable, people would have formed families earlier? Maybe, yeah. maybe. Another social problem is the the fact that many Israelis live in what they some many of them call Judea and Samaria, and others call the occupied territories, and other call ad administered territories. In, in short, people live in, in, in territories that are not... Uh, whose status is not clear. Whose status is not clear. And this is another... Is a, it's another schism within the, the Israeli psyche. Mm. It's, it's, it it's another us and them problem. Yeah. Do you see also a popular culture that is at odds with the elitist culture or culture of the elites? Is there a cultural problem, a cultural war, Kulturkampf, like in the in the technique of There, the there were changes. If you asked, if you had asked me in the seventies, I would say there is uh, Mizrahi music, there is Oriental music, which is being propagated through cassettes uh, uh, at the central central, bus, uh, central yes. bus station. But this has reached mainstream, okay. and and the the music that was once elite has become marginalized. Mm -hmm. If you go to concert halls in Israel, you see all white heads like and mine. What do white heads feel about? Do, you feel, do they, they feel, they they feel a, an enclave? In they feel like they're they're in a ghetto, like a, <laughs> a reservation. But not a war. There's no not, not not a war. Not a war exactly. Why no. not a war? Why there's no culture camp? Why, why, why the elites don't fight back and try to... Oh, it's, it's like Lydia asked why. It's the big why question. Because, you know, you, elitists are usually... Most elitists are fine okay. dimensional, what you call. You know, they're, they're placed, placed, okay. placed, and they don't want to break rules, and, you know, they're, they're, you also said lazy, so maybe we are lazy, I don't know. So the character of Israel is being transformed. It is, yes. Isn't this a, a good thing because Israel is getting more integrated into the region? I think it's a good thing. 
It's and it has very becoming more Arabic. So it, to speak. it it has good good facets and it has bad facets. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Is this the Israel you wanted to live in? Did you want to live in an, in another Arab country? Well, um, you from Romania and German school. And is this how you wanted to end up? You, I, I, I'm a very good disciple. I, I, <laughs> I know that even the meanings of words are, are changing within me as I go along. Uh, Arab is not what I used to think Arab was. Uh, elite is not why, what I used to think that elite was, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I'm getting used to the you're new situation. It. it sounds like cognitive dissonance. Like you're it's, not, it's you're not totally happy with it, but you it's, have it's, the sour grapes. You know, yeah, the grapes right, right. It's very possible. That's, that's so me. So what, what are your values from all this? My, uh, my values? Yes. Trillion. On to, the end of To be a mensch. That's very short. Be a person. To live the appropriate life. Right. To be dig dignified. Yes. You know, it's called in, in Greek philosophy, phonetic. To be phonetic. Phonetic? Phronetic. 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 To be phronetic is to live the appropriate life and to follow a, to follow a set of values which would render you both useful and, and benef benevolent to other people. To okay. other people. That's that is, phronetic. That is a very nice. Yes, it's, yeah, a, it's a good very conclusion. Very nice definition it's of being good, human. It's a good conclusion for our talk. Yes. Elvis, thank you very much for having suffered us for four days. <laughs> you, lo you look changed, <laughs> but thank you. Transformed. You're transformed. <laughs> thank you.